New Hampshire. John spent the early part of his career working himself as an independent options broker on the floors of both the New York and the American Stock Exchange. Then he and his wife started a medical billing company, which they grew and then sold before moving to Pelican Bay 14 years ago with their four children. Now, John is a co-founder of Signal House Group, a team of real estate agents who work under Compass Realty here in Pelican Bay. A highlight for John is when he stood next to his then eight-year-old son as that son threw out the ceremonial first pitch in the second game of the 2008 World Series. Pretty cool, right? He's also an Opera Naples volunteer, a former treasurer of Southern Extreme Water Ski Team, and his topic today is Trends in Real Estate. Please welcome John Funk. Sell this stock, and I would run 
actually, we're called runners, we weren't allowed to run, so I would walk briskly, basically the distance of this room, and give the order to a, a, a clerk. He would put the order in, tell me that he did it, and I would run back and tell the trader what he did. So this is a summer job. I'm probably making about $100 a week, and I look like I'm 12 years old. So my first day on the floor in the Chicago Board Options Exchange, they were not using hand signals in Chicago in 1980. I said to the clerk, how come you guys don't use hand signals like they do in New York? And he said, you know hand signals? I said, yeah. He said, teach me. So I did. And I walked out on the floor. And a guy comes over and says, hey, runner, buy 2,000 shares of Kermit D at 26 and a half immediate. So I did this. And he stepped away from here. So it's a wake you up. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> KMG, buy 2,000 at 26 and a half immediate. And the trader next, next to me goes, what did you just do? I just gave you your order. He goes, what are you talking about? And I hear somebody in the back go, oh, the guy, the guy that I gave the order to, and he goes, you filled, you did the order. So the trader, says, I said, you bought your stock? He goes, are you shitting me? Wait right here. <laughs> Wait right here. He goes back to the back of the room, make sure all that stuff happened, comes back, it says, I understand you're here just for the summer. Uh, I'm one of the biggest traders for first options. I've already talked to the powers that be and gotten approval. You'll be standing next to me the whole summer that you're here. <laughs> he goes, and by the way, I'm buying you lunch every day. I've already ordered you lunch today. You're starting with a shrimp cocktail and a filet. <laughs> that was my entry into the wall. When, 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 when I got down to the floor, the um, and I actually started working and I was on the floor of the uh, American, uh, uh, the New York Stock Exchange, the options floor was there. They, they had a promotional video done because it was new. And since I was on the floor, I was in it. Now, I found that video. It was on a VHS. I uh, thought I thought you guys would like this. I, I, I put it, it's a little blurry. Uh, I put it on, uh, I, I edited it down to 30 seconds. In the last few seconds, you'll actually see me back in 1984. This is the index options trading post at the New York Stock Exchange. It is about 40 minutes till the open, but everyone is getting ready. Orders are already coming in. As the opening approaches, brokers prepare early orders and wait. Okay, so that's me executing an order on the floor right there. <laughs> And there I am doing some hand signals. This is all like real stuff. Um, and the cool thing about the video is I haven't changed in 36 years. <laughs> Except for the glasses. <laughs> a couple of years ago, a couple of years after that, I went over to the, uh, the American Stock Exchange. That's me in the middle of the pit with a bright orange jacket. I was an option spread broker. Now the reason I wanted to show you that video in this picture is because um, this doesn't exist anymore. The floor is gone. Technology pretty much made uh, these jobs all disappear. <coughs> this is what the floor of the New York Stock Exchange looks today during the trading day. There's nobody there. On the back end, you might see CNBC. You might see some traders walking around. It's purely for TV. Um, everything is all electronic now. So the open outcry uh, that they used for 200 years on the New York Stock Exchange is gone. All electronic, internet-based high-speed trading, algorithms, um, it went away. So the, the industry just changed dramatically. I was on the floor for about 10 years, and then I started a medical billing company. I built that up. I had about 25 uh, women working for me. And halfway into that career, the internet also <coughs> came in and, and transformed that industry as well, where the, um, because you could access computers from anywhere in the world, I would go to medical billing conferences and there would be these companies from India and said, hey, we can come to your office, we can learn all the different operations that all the people do in, in, in all the data processing operations. We can train people in India and we'll do it for $4 an hour instead of the $18 to $20 an hour you're paying now. So that industry actually changed pretty dramatically as well. Um, other companies that got affected by um, industry changes, by, or technology issues, in Polaroid and Kodak, they're gone. Kodak was one of the Dow stocks probably in the 70s and 80s. 
uh, that they were just too slow to react to, um, they were too slow to really embrace digital, and they didn't, and, and they kind of went away. Sears, they just announced recently that they were closing all of their stores. Amazon probably took them out. Why go to Sears when you can just push a button and it's there the next day and it's really easy to return things? Blockbuster Video, this is a good one because they used to be on every single corner like in big cities. And what the story behind Blockbuster Video is Netflix approached them in their infancy and said, why don't we do the online piece and you guys will do uh, the store piece. And Blockbuster Video was like, what do we need you for? <laughs> Two years later, Blockbuster Video went chapter 11, and today I think Netflix's probably stock valuation is about $160 billion. So real estate. Uh, is real estate heading with technology? What's it doing to real estate? Is it heading in a new direction? It already kind of has. Um, realtors, are they going to become obsolete? Um, the other jobs I have, obviously, people end up it changed a lot. But real estate transactions are really complex. Uh, they are, you know, you, every time there's a transaction, you're dealing with deeds, inspections, property liens, uh, HOA assessments, mortgages, lots of legal works, and lots of problems. So realtors are there to help people, guide them through this, because most people don't do like stock trading, where you're trading kind of constantly a lot of times. Um, most people only do four or five transactions in their lifetime. Um, so I don't see realtors becoming obsolete. <coughs> Will real estate commissions go down? Technology usually that makes things a little bit more um, efficient, which will probably make prices come down a little bit. Um, unless you're adding a value-added proposition to <coughs> the transaction, there's a good chance that real estate commissions will come down. So obviously I've seen change before, so I'm a little concerned with this, uh, this business. So I'm talk a little bit about real estate as it exists today. And what I'm talking about when I talk about real estate, these entities, I'm talking about um, transactional entities where you're buying and selling real estate. And not really talking about investment type, like real estate investment trusts and, and that kind of thing. So there's, as I look at it, there's three real estate entities out there. Uh, traditional brokerages, technology-related real estate companies, and then there's kind of a hybrid of both of them. Traditional real estate companies, they've been around a long time. Uh, they are kind of brick and mortar. You go down Fifth Avenue uh, or Main Street anywhere in the USA, You'll see the Century 21 office, the Sotheby's office as you walk down the street. <coughs> um, kind of like Blockbuster. <laughs> and they're somewhat complacent. They're, they're kind of traditional and they kind of have the attitude of like, we've been around a long time and we're, 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 we are who we are. They tend to be a little bit more reactive than proactive. Um, and they cater mostly to agents and not as much to consumers. So who are those real estate companies? those traditional real estate companies. They've got a list of the top five um, up there, and the reason I have them separated out is because those five, Premier Sotheby's, Coldwell Banker, Century 21, ERA, and Cochrane Group, they're all, for the most part, franchises, and they're under this umbrella called Realogy, which is a publicly traded stock. And when I was, I used to be a Sotheby's agent before I moved over to Compass, and every time I did a real estate transaction, a 6% franchise fee would come out of my check and go to Realogy, and that's kind of how they would make money. Um, so the, the other traditional brokerage companies that are not part of Realogy, Berkshire Hathaway, John R. Wood, Town & Fry, lots of ones that you've heard of, and lots of ones that, that just get started up. Um, it's very easy to get into that industry and start your own real estate um, company. There's just a lot of legal uh, aspects you got to uh, have done. So what I thought would be kind of a precursor of what's coming um, is to kind of take a look at at least Realogy and what's happened to their stock price. So back in May of 2013, Realogy hit uh, an all-time high of $53.53 .53 a share. 
September of last year, five months ago, they traded as low as $4.33 a share. They lost 92% of their value. And this is when the stock market is soaring. So what happened? Why did the stock go down? Well, it's a, probably a number of reasons. I don't know if I can pinpoint these. Just kind of some of what I see happening is these stocks all have, um, uh, or this stock has a lot of high debt. So all those um, Fifth Avenue, Main Street, Madison Avenue storefronts they have are expensive to either own or rent, taxes, maintain, and they're just not getting the traffic there that they were getting before. So that's one reason the prices the price of the stock might have gone down. Lower margins, people coming in, there's so many realtors right now, um, even in Collier County. Actually, if, 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 if you're a, a realtor in this room, or if you've ever been a realtor, either in this state or any other state, raise your hand. So I, I would say there's probably 20 or 30 of you, which is 10% of the room. So one out of every 10 people has been or is a realtor. Um, so there's a lot of them. So it causes uh, a lot of competition, which might bring the commissions down, which means they're going to get less revenue. The other thing is loss of revenue from agents leaving. I was a Sotheby's agent, so every time I took an commission, they were going to get a piece of my check. My partner was a, a top agent at Century 21. She left there, and we joined a, com a company that was outside of the OG. So they lost all that revenue from us. But probably one of the main reasons, I think, is that investors are just not believing in that brick-and-mortar model anymore and kind of getting out of that stock. The second group of entities are <coughs> technology-related real estate companies. Now, these are all online. Uh, they have online presence only. They cater mostly to consumers rather than agents. So most of the people in here have gone to Zillow and when you go to Zillow, you're, you're not dealing with an agent versus going to a traditional company. <coughs> they're very proactive. They're very innovative. Uh, who are they? Zillow, Redfin, Trulia, Realtor.com. Um, one of the innovative things that, that they've done that fairly recently <coughs> is something called iBuyer. Has, has anybody ever heard of iBuyer? Okay, one, two, three, five, five people. What iBuyer is, is you get people who decide that they want to sell their house, but they don't want to go through the hassle of getting it ready to sell, of advertising it, of having people come in. They just want to sell it. So iBuyer is there for those type of people where you can just give them your address, answer a few questions. Uh, within 24 hours, they'll give you an offer on your house, and they'll close in 20 days. So, but you can imagine what that offer is. It's low. It's similar to taking your car to a, a used car dealership because you don't want to deal with people coming to your house and all that kind of thing. And you sell it to the used car dealer and what happens? They get rid of the french fries, they take out the car seat, they steam clean the engine, they detail it, they put it back in the showroom floor and they make their margin and they make their money. So that's kind of um, what I buy from this. So Zillow, we looked at the stock um, of a traditional real estate company. Zillow is probably the biggest. They're about, a, a, I think, a $10 billion stock valuation anyway. They had an IPO in 2006. Uh, or actually, they, they started getting IPO funding in 2006 at about $3 a share from investors. They went public in 2011 at $20 a share, pretty good return. In June of 2018, the stock got up to $65 a share. Uh, that was kind of their, their, their high point, and then it had a big dip in uh, September of 2019 down to $29 a share. There was a uh, price drop, lower guidance, uh, and growth slowed down. Since then, the stock's come back a lot. I think it's probably back up to $50 a share right now, um, but that's the stock market for you. It's kind of uh, an up and down thing. The third type of uh, real estate company is kind of a hybrid of both. They cater both to the consumers and to agents. High level of technology, they have leadership from high, high tech backgrounds. Uh, proactive, innovative, very fast growing. It's the company that I and my partner moved to. We actually met at the company and joined forces and started a, uh, 
uh, a real estate entity. Or, uh, it, it, it actually lets you be a, uh, an entrepreneur within that company, which is kind of nice. It's called Compass. That's where I went to. They started in 2012. Um, it, they're privately held. A lot of people haven't heard about them. I do want to tell you a little bit about them. Uh, in the last four years, they've gone from 2,900 agents nationwide to 15,000. And the agents that they take on are top agents. So I couldn't have gone there unless I was doing at least $5 million a year for a certain number of years in, in transactions, not in income. <laughs> so, um, so they're getting kind of the cream of the crop. So when you take all these agents from all these other companies, that's what I was talking about before, where, where Realogy might have lost uh, a lot of top agents and a lot of income, that's kind of where they went to is, is a lot of times it's Compass. They, they offer products that kind of create a value proposition. Their investors are SoftBank, Founders Fund, Fidelity, Goldman. They raised $1.6 billion, which is unheard of in this industry. From my Wall Street days, I know who the Founders Fund is anyway. And, and they invested in, in Uber and Netflix and Amazon and really smart people. And um, they're not a public company yet, but I don't know if you can see all these numbers. In 2013, investors who, who started investing in this company, the, probably all these companies, um, there was a valuation of $135 million on the company who we were invested in 2013. Two years later, they got more money, uh, another round of funding, and it went up to $800 million. And then two years later, $2.2 billion to $4.5 billion. Last July, they had funding at $6.4 billion. So they're already, from a, from a dollar standpoint, they're already four times the value of Realogy, which is all those other companies. Um, and that part is Speculation, obviously. Uh, we don't know where it's going to become an IPO. So they're proactive with services. What do they do? Um, why do agents flock to them? It, it gives it gives agents a chance to um, kind of help people, and that's why I that's why I went over. The, the, one of the biggest things they have is something called Compass Concierge. It's kind of their answer to that i buyer, the i buyer who says, "Hey, we'll just take your house and we'll put the money in and sell it." Compass Concierge allows me to give my customers, or potential customers, money to fix up their house, to um, get it ready to sell, to paint it, to do the landscaping, to put in new floors, whatever you want, up to $50,000 I can give. Interest free, there's no fees, there's no uh, markup costs, and it's kind of a way that now you can get your house in the shape it needs to be, so when we put it out there, it's going to sell faster, it's going to sell for a higher price. So that's just one of them. They also have something, bridge loans, which is a, a similar thing that they do, where somebody comes in and they really like a house, but they don't really want to sell, they, they can't buy it until they sell their house. Um, Compass provides bridge loans and gives interest-free loans to pay the fees and, and the actual payments for six months. So it's just pretty outside the box kind of thinking. Gives me a lot of power to get customers. I think last year I gave over three hundred and fifty thousand dollars of these interest-free loans through Compass. And it's not me; it's, it's Compass, so it doesn't cost anything. <coughs> uh, Compass also lets consumers. If you go, if everybody in here goes home and goes Compass.com and puts in Naples, Florida, you're probably going to see 50, 60 listings that aren't on Zillow or aren't on any other site. It's agents pre-list them on the Compass site so just to kind of get some uh, feedback before it actually goes live. So it's kind of a cool thing. So that's why I'm kind of saying that they're, they're kind of a hybrid of the two. In other words, they're, they're also a real estate company. So the future, you know, I think over the next five years there's going to be a lot of rapid change. If there's a pullback in the real estate market and there's a um, downturn, there's probably going to be some consolidation because those companies that have all those uh, storefronts aren't going to be able to afford them. That's just my personal opinion. So what I want to do now is talk numbers. And um, every day somebody comes up to me and says, how's the real estate market? And they say, and the answer is, in different parts of the, of the country, the real estate market is different, um, even in Naples. Uh, there's going to be hot areas of Naples and 
other areas that aren't doing so well. So to really answer the question, and even in Pelican Bay, the same thing, um, depends on what you're, where you're doing. So to answer the question, there's, uh, there's a term called absorption rate. And to me, that's one of the best things that you can look at to figure out how the market is for what you're interested in. And what it does is it gives you kind of a supply-demand ratio that tells buyers and sellers whether, uh, how aggressive they need to, if they're selling, how aggressive they need to price their property or how not aggressive to price their property. And if you're a buyer, how aggressive you should be making your offers. So what I thought I'd try to do, uh, I'm going to try to teach you how to um, calculate an absorption rate. And it's a simple calculation. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when I'm done teaching you, you're going to, um, you're going to feel really smart. You're going to feel like this. The sum of the square roots of any two sides of an isosceles triangle is equal to the square root of the remaining side. The sum of the square roots of any two sides of an isosceles triangle is equal to the square root of the remaining side. Oh, John, that's, that's a right triangle, you idiot! Go! Oh. <laughs> so, this is my way of getting some, uh, did you know, one of my did you knows into, into the, the presentation. So, if you get my, my weekly, uh, uh, email notification, I have these did you knows. This week I put something about the Scarecrow and the Wizard of Oz for signing the wrong calculation. So that, that actually is the wrong calculation. If you go back and you read it, it tells you what makes it the right calculation and why it's wrong. It's just kind of a cool thing. So the absorption rate. Um, for, to, to be able to do this, you need to know, and, and first before I say that, um, the first thing you need to do is identify the area that you want to know how the real estate market is. And when you, when you um, identify that area, it might be where you live, it might be someplace else where you live. I'll use an example in Pelican Bay. You need to have a sample size that's big enough to make this thing be more, the bigger the size, the more accurate the number's going to be. So um, you need two numbers, actually that's a two. Two numbers. Uh, the two numbers you need is you need to know how many properties are on the market in the area that you're looking at, and how many in that same area have sold in the last year. That's it. You know those two numbers, and, you, and a small multiplication at a, at a division number, um, and you're going to know what the market's like in that particular area. So, as I said, you take the current of the active uh, homes, and I put a capital A with, a with the word active because that's the number you need first. Uh, you're going to take one number and divide it into the other, and I just want you to remember which way, which way it goes. So you take the active homes, and you divide it by the 12 months of sales, and then you multiply it by 12, and that's going to tell you how much months of supply is in that area. So as an example, let's say you're in a high-rise. Uh, in Pelican Bay, you're in the Grosvenor. Grosvenor has a hundred and some odd units. There's not a lot for sale. It's really not a big enough um, uh, market to really get this number to be good. So maybe we'll take a look at the, the Dorchester. It's a similar building right next door, same, built in the same time, same size apartments. Um, we add that to it. Maybe we'll throw in the Stratford because that's also another similar building. And we take those three buildings and we say, all right, in those three buildings, how many properties are for sale? And this is something you can probably go out and get on Zillow, or you can talk to a realtor uh, and get that number. And then we go up and say, in the last year, in those same three buildings, how many have sold? So I just, these are just, I just threw these numbers, they're not real, but, so the example I've got up there is 30 properties are for sale right now in these three buildings. In the last year, 15 have sold. 30 divided by 15 happens to be 2. Multiply that by 12. There's a 24-month supply of properties in that section of Pelican Bay. That's a long time. They're basically saying it's going to take 24 months for these all to sell, to get absorbed. So 24 months is a long time. If you're a seller and you know this, if you really want to sell your place and you don't want it to take 24 months, you've got to do a couple things. You've got to make your place look the nicest, and then you also got to price it really aggressive. Because anybody coming to look at those properties is going to look at at least 10 of the other 30. And they're going to go, hmm, which one's the best deal? So it's a really good number. And if you're a buyer and you know this, it's like, well, 
there's a lot for sale here. I'm just going to offer this guy a little bit lower. If he doesn't take it, I'll go to the next one and try that one. So let's just kind of have how, how that works. Well, fast example I've got up there. There's only 10 for sale, and in the last year, 30 have sold. So 10 divided by 30 is 0.33. You multiply it by 12, and you have a four-month supply of properties that you have out there. That's not very many. Now, if you're a seller, it's like, well, I know I'm going to sell this thing quick. Why don't we just kind of bump up the price? Because I think I've got the nicest unit of the 10. Or, and if you're a buyer, and like, well, I tried to buy that one, and they didn't take my offer, and it sold. I tried to buy that one, the same thing happened. Well, now you know that you're going to have to pay a little bit more to get in there. So that's what this absorption rate does. It gives you the months on the market, um, which is, which is uh, kind of a, a nice thing. So Pelican Bay, I did this last night. Uh, or Yeah, I did this last night. There's currently 244 properties on the market in Pelican Bay today. And this is all of Pelican Bay, including Bay Colony, everything. In the last year, there was 308 sales. So 244 divided by 308. If you had a calculator, you did it, it'd come out to 0.792. You multiply it by 12. There's a 9.51 9 month supply of properties in Pelican Bay overall right now. Um, I broke it down and then did the math for single family homes. There's 33 for sale. There's 36 that sold. 0.916 times 12, there's an 11 month supply of single family homes. Again, I did it with villas. There's only a 4.92 month supply of villas. So they seem to be the hottest market in Pelican Bay right now. Um, high rises and single families are over 11 months. And then in the, in the lower uh, corner over there, it kind of tells you that if it's one to five months, it's kind of a seller's market. If it's six to seven months, it's, more, it's somewhat of a balanced market and anything over that is more of a, a buyer's market. So pretty much it's a buyer's market now in, in, in Pelican Bay, um, except for Billings, I would say. So that's kind of a, an, an interesting number. Uh, oops. Okay, okay, so let's see these. So this is some kind of interesting data too. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the data because everybody's going to want different, to know different things. Uh, and now that I've, I've taught you how to do the absorption rate, you can go back on your own and, and figure out your own little market. Now, down here at the bottom, 2018 versus 2019 sales. There was 327 sales in 18, only 296 in 2019. So there's 27 plus 4. 31 less sales, almost 10% than last year. But look at the average price. The average price in 2018 of all the sales in Pelican Bay was uh, $1,327,000 versus over $2 million in 2019. It shows you how these numbers can get skewed by not a lot of sales. The Strand, the high sale last year um, was $19 million. The year before the high sale was $11 million. Well, there was another sale at $16 million, uh, $14 million on there as well, there was only one strand, there was only one the year before at 11 million. Also, a lot of these single family homes sold in 19 uh, that were built um, at five, six, seven million dollars. So that kind of skewed this number up quite a bit. Um, and you can see, um, I broke it down by um, price point. And, and when you're doing the absorption rate, you don't have to just pick single family homes you can actually do a search of, I want to know everything that's for sale in Pelican Bay that's a single family home or a detached villa that's between three and a half and five million dollars. Um, I actually did that for a customer yesterday. It was, uh, I think there was four for sale and six that have sold in the last year. So there's an eight month supply of those. So if you just do the math, four divided by six times as well. So, um, you can break it down any way you want for wherever your market is. You can even do it in you know, New Jersey, California, wherever you want to do it. You just need to get those two numbers and remember this, this simple calculation and then just be like the scarecrow. I hope. So other things that change the value in, um, in properties in, uh, is, is HOA changes, uh, pet policy, Rental changes, 
So some people, all of a sudden, they want to have like a big rental income, and the HOA changes their rental policy in Pelican Bay because people got on the board and they just don't like all this transient population. So they said, oh, we can only do one rental now, and it's a, a minimum of 90 days. Well, you're going to lose a certain amount of people, but you're going to gain other people that like that. Um, one of the things in Pelican Bay that changed recently that I thought I would mention is there's a new guidelines for single family homes. So everybody saw all these gigantic single family homes come up. And over the last few years, they created a committee and they came up in September with these new um, architectural review guidelines. I have it right here. It's 148 pages. <laughs> and, and some of the major changes I put up here. Um, the biggest one I think is 35% lot coverage after setbacks. So if you have a single family home and what was happening is these, these developers were coming in, tearing them down, and putting these the biggest property they could on the lot. So they've made it so it limits how big you can do it. And so developers can't quite build, build as big properties as they could before. Um, the impervious surface coverage can't exceed 55%. Lot coverage of roofed areas. Uh, so, so what this did is it actually caused a lot of developers to decide that maybe we want to start looking at other areas because we can't pay what we could pay before to get to get the return that, that we wanted. So whether this is good or bad, some people like it because it keeps Pelican Bay looking uh, more like Pelican Bay looked before. Uh, and other people don't like it because all of a sudden maybe they feel that their lot, that, that their, their property is not devalued. Um, I will tell you, I'm, I'm selling my dad's house right now, and the houses, you saw the 11-month uh, um, absorption rate for single-family houses. It's gone up, uh, and it feels like single-family houses are staying on the market a little bit longer because the developers that used to come and snap them up and tear them down, they kind of pulled back, or they pulled back to a point where they're not going to offer you as much. And, it's hard to like go, well, wait a minute, that one just sold for 1.6 million. Why are you only giving me 1.2 million now? They can't build as big of a house. Um, time wise, okay. A couple money saving tips. I think I'll homesteading. I'm going to skip that uh, so I have a little bit of time at the end. Um, alternatives to mortgages and loans. So, a lot of people, especially in Pelican Bay, have pretty big stock portfolios. Um, my, my feeling, uh, well, my background with stock portfolios is, is I know a lot of the companies that are out there. Uh, people who want to go buy a house, they, this is just an alternative to a mortgage or a bridge loan, is where you can borrow <coughs> against your stock portfolio. And what that enables you to do is not have to sell your stocks and pay the capital gains. But it also makes it so you don't have any fees, you don't have any appraisal needed, you don't have any bank charges, there's no insurance, and you can borrow the money. And the rates that you can get if you move your account to a certain place are really, really low. Um, and there's risks involved, and you would need to kind of know about that. But the company that, that I know about, um, it's called Interactive Brokers. They're, they're the biggest lenders against stock portfolios. Um, you can actually borrow three and a half million at under 2.25 percent. Um, you can only usually borrow a percentage of your stock portfolio, and there's risk that if the market tanks, they will liquidate it for you. Um, <laughs> if it goes below a certain threshold. So, but if you have a big portfolio and you only want to borrow, say, $25,000, you can see the, the, the difference in rates. So, you can borrow $25,000 at 3.06%. If it's $300,000, it's 2.72%. Compared to what Charles White's Fidelity goes, um, and, and at $3.5 million, you borrow at 2.18%. So it's just a, an alternative way to, to borrow money if you wanted to get into real estate, uh, or really for anything that you wanted to. So I wanted to leave some time for questions. Hopefully, they're not hard ones. Uh, so thank you, <laughs> and any questions? <laughs>
uh, in the housing market, uh, what if there are only calculations that are kind of very helpful? Uh, what if there are only one or two similar properties? Large area, Pelican Bay, Pelican Marsh, uh, similar kind of home, similar price range. Uh, what are you using then to compare? Because you haven't got 100. You yes. just got to keep expanding. You got to expand to other neighborhoods. You just got to keep going out to get those num to get those numbers to work. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, and that's uh, the the uh, bridge financing. Uh, Interactive. Did you say it's, it's the name of it? Or did you go through you, or did you go to look it up? You just you just go online. Uh, Interactive brokers is the place. And I don't get anything out. <laughs> So there was a site where uh, uh, agents could go and uh, kind of pre-list the home with Compass. Can you tell us about that? What is that site? So, so they, they call it kind of coming soon. Um, so if I listed, if you listed a home with me, the idea is to get it out there, kind of like a movie trailer. So you go to the movies and you say, hey, here's a here's a, a, a one coming up, um, and they do like these little movie trailers. So the idea is to like get out there, get some excitement, and then get some feedback whether the price is too high or too low. What's kind of nice about it is you put it out on the coming soon, and we put it out at a million dollars. Um, and we get feedback from, from agents during the, the 15 or 20 days that it might be taking to get the house ready to actually list, uh, to stage it or whatever. And then we realize that, you know what, that's probably too high. When we finally <laughs> list it in 10 days or however many days it is, um, let's list it at, at 875. And that $1 million number goes away. Nobody ever sees it, it was ever there. Unlike when you put it on the MLS and you drop it, you can see the hit price history of, pro of properties. This one, you don't see it. It's just there and gone. And John, great presentation. How has the opening of Mystique uh, skewed the figures that you gave for Pelican Bay? And what do you see in the future as far as uh, the second Mystique going up, yeah. the effects it will have? Um, I don't think it's skewed it that much. I mean, that one, in 2018, 2019, um, I don't know exactly what the numbers of sales in Mystique were um, between the two years. Uh, Mystique's been, been selling great. Uh, What's going on? And the price of go, originally you could have gotten into Mystique for like 3.2 million, and now they start at about 4.2 million. Right here. Right here. Yep. Uh, thanks, John. In the latest ed edition of The Economist magazine has an article, Property in America, the real estate racket. Property brokers get a bad rap all over the world in America, they deserve it. And there's a chart of commission rates in different countries showing in America an average 5.5%, 6%. In the UK, for example, it's 1.5%. Um, and it basically says at the heart of the problem is a, is a lot of obsolete practices that seem to favor insiders rather than buyers and sellers of property. You said you thought commission rates might fall a little bit. They're arguing that because of technology, they're going to fall a lot. I mean, how would you respond to that? Well, I think with real estate transactions, like I said before, and I'll be honest with you, before I got into real estate, I kind of thought, what realtors do, they're getting a lot of money for what they actually do until I've been in it. I can't tell you how many people I go through to actually get a sale. So. You're, you're actually paying not just for what you do, you're paying for everything that they've been doing, which is unfortunate, but that's kind of just how it works. Uh, I, think, I think if you add a value-added proposition, I, mean, I, I had a customer who I was able to give him a $50,000 loan to get his place ready. Uh, that's a value-added proposition that I was able to give him. And realtors, I think what they have to do is they have to kind of go above and beyond. They have to do things not just listed on, uh, on the MLS, they've got to go and they've got to call all the neighbors, like literally get on the phone, call all the neighbors. And if you can do all these things and show customers that, hey, I do this differently than other realtors, uh, and we're going to do this, this, and this, and this, and this, then there's a way to keep your, your, your prices up uh, or, or your commissions higher. But like you said, technology is definitely bringing them down. Um, and, and I think they will go down. Just how much and when. 
John, thanks for the presentation. Uh, are the um, prices of uh, brokerage commissions negotiable? Uh, it, it, does it depend on the size of the property and how much of the weight does one have? So they, they are negotiable, but I'll tell you that depending on who you're with, some of them are like totally up to the agent. Other ones, you have to get approval from who you work for. When I was at Sotheby's and even at Compass, if it's under a, a certain amount and um, they want you to get 6%, if it's under 500,000, that they want you to charge 6%. You can still charge less because it's your business as a realtor, but if you don't get permission from the brokerage, you're giving that that uh, that deduction out of your own pocket versus you know them participating with you on the reduction. Uh, so you can do it. So any realtor can put any number they want on. There, it, it's totally negotiable. And another question: uh, If your house, let's say, is a five months supply, and your house is not sold six months, seven months, uh, some people take it off the market. It, it's, it's tired. It's, it's just uh, just worn out, and is that a good idea to remove it from the market? Yeah, it can be. It, it, I guess a lot of it depends on what's going on, if it, especially in Naples where there's a season. Um, I think it's better to keep property on the whole time if it hasn't sold, and it does it. it so it's it's not selling for one of a couple reasons. Either people just don't want to buy it because there's too much work to do, which is a, probably one of the biggest reasons, um, or the price. And if you want to sell it, you're just going to have to keep you know, dropping the price until it gets to where you want. Or fixing it up <coughs> and getting it to that level will keep it on the market. I would keep it on the market. Thanks, John. John, you mentioned something about loaning out to maybe $50,000 to your store or home. Mm -hmm. How do you work in your profit with something like this? So, all that does for, for me as the realtor is it gets me, um, if, I have, if I give uh, that $50,000 to someone to fix up their home, then hopefully they're gonna, I'm going to help them do it, but they're also going to sign a listing agreement with me. So that gets me the listing agreement. Uh, the listing agreement is for the length of the loan, which is 12 months, and if the home doesn't sell after 12 months, you have to repay the loan. Uh, or sign up for another 12 months. But the whole purpose of the $50,000 is to make the house sell. That's the goal of you and me. And if, it, if we fix it all up and it's really nice and everybody loves it and still hasn't sold, the only thing you got left is the price. It's just probably overpriced. All right, great talk. I, uh, in your experience, what is the um, most common fix-up or renovation that's required? So a, a lot of properties in um, in Naples, things are getting older. So sometimes it's it's just paint landscaping, depending if it's a condo or if it's a single family hot house. And a lot of it is, is staging, uh, getting rid of that old furniture and the, the artwork is just not in in tune of what, what's today. Because you walk into somebody else's house, you walk into their house. So a good stager will neutralize everything. They'll paint it, they'll get rid of, uh, uh, maybe if it needs new appliances. It's really the first impression when you walk through the door. It's like, oh, this is nice. And um, I, I think staging, and virtual staging, you can do it, but eventually these people are going to come to the house and they're going to go, like, where'd all the furniture go? <laughs> <laughs> Give me that picture. Is a uh, price per square foot for comparable areas uh, a good way to measure one home against another price oh, yeah. per square foot? Yeah, uh, totally. I do that all the time. Um, but you also have to look at other factors when you're looking at price per square foot. So new construction price per square foot for single family homes is $1,100 a square foot. A renovated home might only be 800 square foot, $800 a square foot in Pelican Bay. Um, so, and then, and then there's other issues as what's the construction of the house, but that's a good guideline, especially when you're going to uh, compare similar types of properties. So, if we look at four new construction homes, all of those, that's going to be the, the cost that you just got to make sure that you do. Yeah. 
together? It's a big question. Uh, we hear that are 390 people a day coming into Florida. Uh, some of that will influence our area. We have an up and down market like a yo-yo. Uh, <coughs> what are your thoughts on where the market is going in the next two years? So I, I've always been the type of person that I don't try to have an opinion um, because it's, it's it's too hard. It's like the stock market, you know, figuring out when you should buy something or when you should sell something. Um, you know, at the, in, in the stock market world, the most expensive sport is bottom fishing. When you think the thing went way down, and you, you bought it because, oh, this thing's way, way down. Well, then it's twice as far down like right after that. So it, it's it's kind of a crash shoot. And, and with real estate, I think a lot of it, too, depends on what's going to happen in the economy. Um, even this coronavirus thing, I mean, I don't know how many people are dead, but if that number goes to 2 million, and the stock market drops 6,000 points, people aren't going to buy houses, especially in the higher end, because that's those are the people that are going to be in the market. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of of the feeling that you should um, sell when you can, not when you have to, uh, or buy. It's, it's either way, you know, do it when you can, not when you have to. How has the development on the square, square, meter, square foot price been over the last couple of years? So it, it, it's the market's been kind of flat, at least in Pelican Bay, um, in the last couple of years. Um, the single family homes uh, a few years ago brought prices up. Uh, and and the, what happens is the, all those teardowns with single family homes, all of a sudden the prices of the single family homes went up. And if all those people that wanted to buy single family homes, they couldn't afford them anymore. But they really like Pelican Bay. So let's look at villas. <coughs> So the villa prices actually started going up because all those people were going over there and people that couldn't afford bills anymore now buying condos because they still want to be in Pelican Bay. So they've gone up, but I think in the last year or two, they've been pretty flat for, for at least condos and, um, and all that other stuff. And I think single family homes are, that, that went up, unless somebody comes and challenges the, the architectural review thing, um, and now that the builders aren't there anymore tearing down homes, I think the price per square foot might come down a little bit. Hey John, thanks for everything you do here. You know, with uh, the uh, email list you put together, I mean, you're a high performer, you're a numbers guy, you uh, make things happen and you're very thoughtful. Appreciate all the bananas, but how many houses do you have to sell to buy the bananas for? <laughs> best-selling agent to give me a comparative market analysis. And I got three different agents come in and give me a price, and that's what I listed it at. I picked the agent I liked the best. I sold it within an hour and went on the market for full listing price. Does that sort of thing still exist if I was going to sell a property? Could I do that? Oh yeah, and, and I think you did it the right way, right? By finding, when you talk to a manager, what they're going to do is they're going to find the right agent for you. Because if you just walk into a, a brokerage outfit, you're going to get the person sitting at the table and they're going to say, oh no, I'm great, I do everything here. And it might not be the guy who is like, oh, do you, you mean there was another agent who lived in my building? Why didn't you tell me about that one? They really know my building. So that's, that's the best way to do it, is find the right person for you. 